Hey guys. Funny, uh, the last time she was talking about strain on muscle. Mm -hmm. I forget one last Friday. Oh, dang. And I was squatting like just 300 pounds. Uh -huh. Going down, I felt like a pop on my back. Ooh. Kind of left 10 pounds after that. Oh, man. And I was like walking like an old man outside. Oh, man. I don't know how I drove back home, but it sucked. Dang. Yeah, you feeling, feeling better? Looks like oh, you're yeah, walking yeah. okay. Yeah, keep but the blood. Was, oh, I couldn't sit well, I couldn't lay down well. Oh, man. Blue, just, uh, oh, man. Well, glad, glad it's not too serious. Yeah, no, it's not too serious. That's good. Will the mental be will it cover everything from till last week or today? Uh, till last week. Last week. Yeah. So, so just a little bit on, on joint articulation. There's nothing on joints. Nothing on joints. Just just up to muscles. Muscle, muscle. Mm -hmm. Okay.
So is everything from that study guide going to be on the exam, like every single piece of information, or not every not every single piece? But that's that's just but that's the scope of what's going to be on the exam. Yeah, because I was doing it, and I just think the anatomy is going to be like the most memorized. <laughs> it is it is a modern name, but it's uh, um, yeah. All right, it's four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone feeling today? Good, good. Everyone have a good weekend? Good? Uh, studying. studying. <laughs> yeah, we have a midterm uh, this, this Wednesday. Um, all right, so uh, so quick, you know, just reminder, um, we have our midterm this Wednesday, everybody. Um, so for those of you on Zoom, uh, just know that you have to, uh, you, you guys are expected to be in person for the, uh, um, for the exam, okay? Uh, because there, there is going to be no virtual exam. So I've, I've already printed everything, uh, and I'm not mailing it to your house. And so you have to, uh, you, have, you have to come here to, uh, uh, to take the exam. Okay. Um, so question, just to clarify, do we get an eight and a half, 11 sheet of paper front and back? Yes, yes, you do. Yeah. So you get a, you get a one cheat sheet for the exam. It's an eight and a half by 11 um, size, and you can put anything, you can put anything that you want. Yeah. So my, my suggestion, so I, I've, I've seen, um, you know, um, it's it's been a while since I've seen it, just because we've been virtual. But you know, I've seen all manner of things on cheat sheets. I've seen people print like literally the 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 answers to all the homeworks and all the lecture notes on their cheat sheet in like in like size two font or something like that. And I see people like going like this on the on the exam. Um, you can't. I mean, uh, you can do that. I'm not stopping you from doing that. But I I think that's that's a little bit less useful because uh, for me, you know, and and the reason I I I, I limit you guys to a cheat sheet. Is that I've always felt that making your cheat sheet is also a great way to study because you're basically taking you know five or six weeks five or six weeks worth of information and then condensing it down into a single sheet front and back. And so by doing that, you kind of naturally select in your mind you know what's the most important information, or you have to scan your notes and decide you know what's the most important things to have. And that in itself is is already a really great study tool. So what do I think would be most useful for us to put on the cheat sheet? So, you know, for this exam, it's, it's a little bit different just than my usual exams, just because it's, it's all conceptual questions. And so I would say, you know, go through the notes and, uh, you know, specifically, you know, I, I, there's going to be a lot of emphasis on bone biomechanics, on muscle biomechanics, uh, but also, you know, go over our lecture notes from strength and materials too. So I'd say those are the three main areas where I pulled questions on from the exam and then go through those lecture notes and then cross-reference with the study guide and see, you know, what's what's the most important information in these notes that I ask for in the study guide, and then put that information on your on your cheat sheet. Yeah. So that's that's probably that's probably the most the biggest hint I can give you without kind of directly, you know, telling you the questions on the exam. But but I'll I'll tell you, you know, how I I'll tell you how I wrote this exam. You know, it's like how I write all my exams that, you know, I give you guys the the study guide and I have it open on one side of my screen and then I have the you know, the exam that I'm writing on the other side. And I kind of, I'm always cross-referencing with the study guide to make sure 
that the question that I'm asking is consistent with something that's on the study guide. And so, you know, if you know the study guide really well and you and you kind of condense that information to a cheat sheet, I'd say you guys are, are in great shape for the exam. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay. um, homework three is due tonight. Um, and so I, I, I apologize. I was a little bit slow on grading homework two. I know you guys turned that in last week, uh, but I just finished that grading that today. And so the solutions for that are up on Canvas. Um, and then, you know, just because the exam is on Wednesday, um, I don't know when I'm going to, I don't know when I'm going to get to create homework three, hopefully by Friday, but I'll put the solutions for homework three on Canvas um, by midnight tonight as well. So you can have that to help you study. Okay. All right. Um, any, any other questions before we get started for today? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and pick up where we left off. And so, and so remember, you know, for the exam, the last thing that's going to be covered is muscle biomechanics. And so I know last Wednesday we started joints, uh, but joints will not be on the, on the exam. So we're going to continue on with the joint lecture note with the um, lecture notes on joint biomechanics today, but you don't have to worry about this for the exam, but it will, it will be on the next exam for sure. Okay, and so where we left off last Wednesday was we were talking about joint stability. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's give a definition for joint stability first. Okay. And so when, uh, when I refer to the stability of a joint, what I mean is that it's, um, what I refer to is its ability to resist dislocation. Okay, because what we talked about last time is that the joint in your body, um, you know, they, they're basically the locations where different bones, you know, meet together. Okay, and so when I talk about dislocation, what I mean is that um, basically, this is when one or both of the bones at a joint, they pop out of the, they pop out of the joint. Okay. Right, and so the more stable a joint is, the, the more it's able to resist um, these bones uh, popping out from each other, okay? Right. And so some factors that can affect joint stability um, are things like the shape of the bones that, that come into the joint and the enragement of the soft tissues at the joint. Okay. All right, so it's very much like a uh, ge uh, it's very geometrically based. Okay. And so um, a lot of times, you know, you can look, you can really just look at a joint and see what the bones are and what and how the ligaments are, and you can kind of determine how um, how stable or not it's going to be. Okay. Um, because the different ligaments in your body and the different bones, of course, you know, they they each have their own properties and and, and um, you know, mechanically speaking, um, but you know most of the most of the variability that you'll see in terms of joint stability comes just purely from a geometric perspective. Okay, and so one factor that uh, one geometrical factor that's often looked at in terms of joint stability is the amount of contact area. Okay, and so generally speaking. The amount of contact area between the articulating bones uh, determines its stability.
Okay. And so the more contact area that you have between the bones, the more stable it's, it's going to be. Okay. And so if you think about, um, if you think about some mechanical joints, right? So if you think about joints between mechanical parts that you would see in like your car or other structures, right? And so generally they design those joints such that they maximize this amount of contact area, right? And so if you think of like a, like a traditional like ball and socket joint, okay? it looks something like this, right? So you have your ball and then your socket kind of really wraps around the ball as, as much as humanly possible. Right, so this is this is what like a mechanical ball and socket would look like. And you can see the way it's designed is, is so that you know um, there's there's as much contact between the the ball part and the socket part. Okay. And the nice thing about mechanical uh, mechanical joints like this, or just mechanical parts in general, is that you can you can design it and you can fabricate it however you want. But for the human body, of course, you know, you don't, we don't really have that freedom. You're kind of just born the way that you are. Um, and so it's really interesting to see the differences between like a really stable joint like the hip versus, um, you know, relatively unstable joint like the shoulder. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. And so human joints um, are a lot less, um, a lot less nice, I should say. I should say, a lot more irregular. Okay. And so one way that you, uh, and one way that they're, um, they're irregular is that the, oftentimes you're not gonna get a perfect, a perfect symmetrical match between the two articulated bones, right? And so if we look back to the kind of the, um, the mechanical ball and socket here, or at least my poor rendition of one, you can see that there's, there's almost like a, 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 a symmetry about it where, you know, one, one, of the, uh, one of the parts here has a certain shape and the other one is fabricated to match that shape exactly, okay? But if you look at most human joints, you know, with the exception of, of some joints, like maybe the hip joint, uh, but even that one is, is also has some irregularities. There's not, there's not as much symmetry uh, between the two articulating bones. Okay. And this asymmetry here makes it really interesting because there, there's certain positions that your limbs can take that'll make the joint, you know, more stable than, um, than the other ones. Okay. Well, in other words, what this is saying is that depending on where your, you know, uh, where your your uh, your limb is, you know, the joint will be more stable in certain configurations than than the other. Okay. Uh, and so the the technical terms for these is that we have a closed packed configuration or closed packed position versus a loose packed position. Okay. And so a closed packed position is one where the contact area is maximum, and the stability is the greatest.
And then the opposite of that would be a loose packed position, which is the exact opposite. Okay. Right. And so one example of, of this would be your ankle joint. Okay. All right. So for, for myself personally, I, I played a lot of soccer and I played a lot of basketball growing up. And so rolled ankles was just a part of my, a part of my life. And so I, I think even now I've rolled my ankle so many times growing up that my ankle ligaments are made of jelly now. And so sometimes I'll just be walking just randomly. And then I'll walk on some uneven ground and my, I'll, I'll roll my ankle just because my, my ligaments there are so, are so bad. Uh, but the ankle is a great example of a, of a, lig of a, of a, of a joint where depending on, on how your foot is positioned, then, your, um, then the stability is going to be one way or the other. Okay. All right. And so I'll, I'll draw a picture of this on the, uh, on the next page, but, but basically, um, you know, we compare two cases where the, the ankle is either in dorsiflexion. Okay. And remember what dorsiflexion means is that you're, you're, you're basically trying to point your toes up to the sky. And so nobody can see this because my feet are behind the table, but they, you know, your ankles are, are basically pointing, pointing up. Okay. Remember, think of that as like, you know, a, like a dorsal fin on a, uh, a dolphin. Okay. So when you're in dorsiflexion, this maximizes the, the stability of the ankle joint. And so um, let's see, I think there were tests done by Millington and two, in 2006, and so not too long ago, which measured the, uh, the amount of contact area of the ankle and dorsiflexion. And what he found was the, the, the contact area, the contact area in dorsiflexion was around 7.34 centimeters squared, plus or minus some variation, of course, between the different, uh, between different people. And the opposite of this is plantar flexions. Remember, plantar flexion is you're pointing your toes towards the ground. And so you're planting your, your toes. And so that's where it came from. And so what they found was this is, this is a position that minimized the contact area, um, where they found that the contact area in, in plantar flexion dropped down to about um, 4.39 centimeters squared, plus or minus some, some variation, of course. And so you can see here that there's, there's a big difference, right? And so just by changing the position of your ankle um, from plantar flexion to dorsal flexion, you can almost, almost double the amount of contact area that you have, okay? And, and in fact, you know, um, and the more contact area they have, then the more stable the joint is going to be. All right, any questions on, on this so far? It's it has to do with um, how the muscles are pulling the um, the joint or pulling the bones towards each other. And so um, when you're in when you're in dorsiflexion, your 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 the the muscles on the front of your leg kind of pull your ankle back toward or pull your foot back towards the ankle joint. Then that motion kind of packs it closer together and increases this, the uh, contact area. Versus when you're in plantar flexion, your calf is kind of pulling your 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 foot away from the uh, from the joint and then that minimizes the contact area. Yeah, it has a lot to do with how the muscles act, act at the joints. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me draw let me draw a picture of you for you to kind of uh, show you what this means. Or very poor pictures, I guess. Right. Okay. And so dorsiflexion kind of looks like this. Kind of. This looks like an elf's foot, but you get the you get the point. And so dorsiflexion, the contact area here, it was about 7.34. Okay. 
And the variability here is about 1.69 centimeters square. Okay. And so that's how much variation they saw, you know, person to person. Okay. Because I think they did this, they did this study with a lot of people. Okay. Versus plantar flexion. at this uh, contact area. Okay. Okay. And so to go back to Jacob's question, you know, the, uh, basically the, the, the big reason why you see big differences between these is that in dorsiflexion, basically you have the, the muscles on the front of your leg, they're pulling your foot upwards like, like this, right? And so your ankle joint is, is about here. So if you can draw the bones, they kind of look like this, right? And so if you have a muscle that kind of pulls the pulls this pulls your foot bone up, then it's going to make the this joint here more stable because you're you're basically pushing the bone back into that joint. And so that, that maximizes the surface area, right? Versus if you compare that to the plantar flexion um, configuration, right? In plantar flexion, um, basically what's uh, what's happening is that the muscle is kind of pulling pulling this way, right? So that's that's kind of what your your um, your calf muscle is doing. And so that that kind of pulls the uh, um, the foot away from the uh, from the joint, okay. And so that minimizes the the surface area. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll give a quick personal story just because uh, people generally enjoy when I when I tell the story. So when I was in eighth grade, I, I actually sprained both my ankles really bad, and I honestly probably should have went to the hospital. Because uh, what I was doing was uh, we were filming a, a jackass video for on one of our friend's birthdays. Um, and the stunt that I did was I jumped, I jumped off um, my friend's like veranda in the backyard. And I was supposed to land on a trampoline, but I ended up hitting the sides of the trampoline, which were made out of metal. So I, I busted my ankle really bad. But I couldn't tell my dad that we were filming a jackass video. And so I told him that I, I sprained my ankle playing basketball. Um, both ankles at the same time. And bless his heart, you know, he never, he never questioned me about how I could sprain both my ankles at the same time playing basketball. And so I never got that checked out. And so that's always something that I've always thought about in the back of my head. That there might be some, there might be something wrong with my ankles because of, uh, because of that day. But I remember not being able to walk for, uh, for quite a while after, after that. But how tall was the ankle? It was basically just, uh, um, it was on, it was on the same, um, it's basically, it was almost the roof, basically. just maybe just a living lower than like the roof of a one story so house. A two, a one, house or one story house. One story house. Yeah. Yeah. So not, not that high, but I was also in eighth grade. So I was like kind of a little kid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And in hindsight, it was pretty fortunate, but, but I also didn't have the worst stunt. And so one, I think one of my friends, um, what he did was like, there was this giant kind of electrical box at a park and he would, um, ride a, he would be on a skateboard and someone would be pulling him on a bike going full speed and he would just ram right into the, the electrical box, no helmet or anything. So I, I, I don't think he's okay. I think he, some, <laughs> I think he suffered permanent brain damage from that. So at least I, if, you know, if, if I had to do that one, maybe I wouldn't be standing here today, but, um, but yeah, definitely, um, definitely didn't get the worst of it, but you know. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> okay. All right, and so, you know, uh, let's talk about this variation a little bit, okay? And so, uh, you know, anytime you do any kind of anatomical measurements, you know, there's always gonna be some variation. And so, you know, I think a, a lot of people, when they see this kind of variation, where you see, you know, 4.39 plus or minus 1.1, that's a, almost like a 30% difference. Um, but that's, that's normal, right? Because everyone is, is really different, you know, both in, the, in their size and in their shape. And that goes for their bones and their joints as well. Okay. So pretty significant variation. So this might seem like an obvious point, just because you know, of course, of course, there's a lot of variation between people. But um, you know, when you think about the joints, which are you know, kind of in between your your bones, 
you know, there's also still a lot of like, you know, little, little, little intricacies between the, uh, the bones that can cause some variations there as well. Okay. Right. And so that, and so what this means is that, you know, some people will just have naturally much more stable joints than other ones. Okay. And I and I wish I, I looked this up before class, but I, I just kind of just thought of it now. But um, you know, I, I think you know if you if you want to correlate um, you know between certain certain factors that people have versus their joint stability, I think probably the one that's the probably the the factor that's most telling of joint stability would just be the size of their bones, right? And so people generally with bigger bones just naturally going to have bigger um, higher amount of stability just because they just naturally have a lot more surface area. But I don't know if I don't know if joint stability is correlated with with you know weight or, or or genetics or anything or anything else. But but I would what I would think is that you know the bigger your bones are, the more stable the joint is going to be. Okay. All right. And so another way that you can increase joint stability is just to simply apply a force um, onto the onto the bones. Okay. Right. And so, um, you know, just, just like we saw here with the, uh, with the foot example, uh, with the muscles, you know, you can apply forces in, in different ways as well. And so the more force that you apply um, at the joint where you push the limbs together or push the bones together, that's gonna increase surface area. Mm -hmm. Professor, is this why fighters wrap their hands in their panties and stuff? Yeah, it's part of it. Yep. Yeah. And so that's uh, and so that's well, um, part of the reason that they uh, yeah they're they're basically increasing they're part of, they're smallly increasing the, the stability at their joints because by wrapping it you kind of apply a compressive force from the wraps and then that naturally kind of pushes their their bones closer together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, any questions on uh, any questions on this? Yeah. All right. And so another factor, you know, besides the shapes of the bones and how much force that they're, they're uh, um, that they're 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 um, taking to get pushed together, the other big um, um, determiner or determinant of joint stability is the arrangement of all the ligaments and muscles. Right. This is this is especially true for joints where the bones themselves don't make a great connection all by themselves, right? Um, and so in those cases, a lot of what's carrying the stability are just you know, the muscles that are surrounding the the joint and also the ligaments. Okay. And so the way, just kind of the way that you can visualize what's what's going on at these types of joints is that the these ligaments and these muscles and tendons they almost act like um, supporting cables um, that that surround the joint, and then they. Uh, uh, what their role is is to absorb any force that tries to dislocate the joint.
Okay. And in the case for the muscles, um, we know that muscles are, you know, they can, they can generate their own tension, right? And so muscles can also act like a, a force that, you know, um, that, that kind of forcibly puts the, the, um, the bones together. Um, but, you know, they can also apply a force to bring the bones back into alignment in case they do get very minorly dislocated. Okay. And so the muscles and, and the ligaments, you know, they, they play a really important role for the joints where, you know, the bones don't, you know, make a great connection, you know, a great stable connection just by themselves. Okay. And so some examples of this would be like the knee or the shoulder. Okay. I think the shoulder is, is actually one of the most um, dislocated joints in the body, if not the most. Um, and, you know, and, and the reason for that is, uh, even though the shoulder is, is a ball and socket joint, so you can move your shoulder a lot, but the amount of contact area in the shoulder is actually really, really small. So you actually, your body actually relies a lot on the muscles in, in your shoulder to really make sure that this, the shoulder stays where it is, okay? Um, and the knee, uh, the knee has a very complex set of ligaments um, that, um, that kind of helps with its stability, okay? And so um, I'm quite familiar with the knee because I, I both me and my dad, we've, we've had um, you know, fairly significant knee injuries in our, in our lives. Okay? And so let me draw what, draw what the knee looks like. And so here's a picture of, of the knee joint. And so up, up top right here, I have the femur, right? So this is your thigh bone. And on the bottom here, we have the tibia. So remember the tibia is the big bone that's in your, in your lower bone, right? And so your knee joint is comprised between these two, these two bones, okay? And so the, um, a lot of the stability in the knee is actually driven by the connecting ligaments, right? Because if you look at the shapes of these bones, you can see the tibia kind of forms like a little platform. And so that's called the tibial plateau, right? Whereas the femur kind of has this kind of dual head shape um, at the bottom right there. So these two, you know, if you kind of push them together, you know, they don't really want to, they don't really want to stay together, you know, just by themselves, right? There's, there's not really much of a, much of a group there. And so what's really holding the knee together is these um, set of ligaments, okay? And so, let me go ahead and draw them in. Okay. Let me draw them all in and then we'll, we'll move on. All right. And so this one right here, we'll call, this is the LCL, okay? That's called the, the lateral collateral ligament, okay? This other one on the outside is called the MCL. And so that's called the medial collateral ligament, okay? And so remember, remember the difference between lateral and medial. So lateral means towards kind of the outside of your body, okay? And so if this were the, the right knee, the LCL would be on the right side. So that's kind of towards where your hand is. Whereas the MCL, the medial collateral ligament, that's toward the as towards the midpoint of your body, right? And so that one's gonna be on the, on the inside, okay? Okay. All right, so those are the two ligaments that are on the outside of your, of your knees, okay? And then on the inside of your knees, you have the, the cruciate ligaments. And so um, this one is the ACL. And this one here is called your PCL. Okay. 
And what ACL and PCL stand for is this, uh, ACL stands for your anterior cruciate ligament. Okay. And PCL here is your posterior cruciate ligament. And so remember anterior meaning the front and then posterior meaning the, the back, okay? And so the, uh, the cruciate, what this refers to is the fact that these two ligaments actually cross over each other, you know, on the inside of your knee and they form that kind of cross shape, okay? And so anterior and posterior kind of refer to where those, those attach. And so a lot of the stability in your knee is, is actually held together by these, uh, by these ligaments here. Okay? And so any, any force that tries to kind of dislocate your knee, your ligaments are gonna take most of that force. Okay? Um, and actually, you know, you'd be surprised that a lot of these ligaments are actually not that strong by themselves. And so the ultimate strength for these ligaments is around anywhere between 150 to, one, to 500 newtons. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. These these can be these can be pretty devastating. Um, yeah, I mean the getting getting these injured is is scary just because yeah you hear a pop and you um, and it and it hurts like crazy. But it also it's also really hard to heal too because these. Um, these ligaments, they, they don't have that many blood vessels going to them, if at all. And so if there's any injury to these ligaments, it's very difficult for them to, to heal up. Um, and actually my dad, my dad tore his ACL playing basketball, um, kind of when I was really young and he had to get it replaced. Um, but actually, you know, I, I, I don't know if they just didn't do that great a job with the replacement, but since then he's, he's never really been the same. Um, which is really sad because, you know, he really liked to play back. He really liked to be active. And so ever since he's had a surgery, he's, uh, you know, um, even, it even, it's even a struggle for him just to jog anyway now. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it sucks. Yeah. yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely scary. Yeah, you want, you definitely want to protect your ligaments at all costs, but, but that's to say that, you know, your, your knees also protected a lot by a lot of the muscles in your, in your leg as well. Um, and so, you know, um, one way to kind of protect the stability of your, of your knees and of your joints just in general is to make sure that, you know, um, is to, you know, really work out and exercise your muscles around your joints, because that's going to, that's going to add to a lot of stability and take a lot of the load off the, uh, off the ligaments. And that's especially important for the knee, which, you know, relies on these ligaments quite a bit for, uh, for stability. Okay? So the more you strengthen like your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your calves, you know, that's going to add a lot of stability to your knee. Um, to prevent, help prevent injury. Okay. My question, I think you can consider a spiral fracture here. Um, yeah, actually, so, um, so the main, uh, maybe it's not, maybe if it's, a, if it's a, uh, if it's an injury to a ligament, it's not technically considered a fracture. So those are, those are more of a sprain. Um, but you're right that a twist, a twisting motion that you have at your knee joint is really dangerous because the main, the main um, structure that, that, that kind of resists that twisting motion is going to be your ACL. And so um, a lot of ACL injuries happen because your someone's foot usually gets stuck in the ground and their body kind of makes a twisting motion. And, you know, what really handles that, that load is going to be the ligaments in your knee. And it's not usually not equipped for, for something strong like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, any questions on, on this? Oh man. Yes. Yes. Yeah, snowboarding is dangerous. Like snowboarding and skiing is really dangerous. A lot of, a lot of injuries can happen during there. So, I mean, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I've always, I always love going to do that, but yeah, just make sure that you're being careful, um, you know, when you're, when you're going. Mm -hmm. What did you say about, I read an article that like for downhill skiers, they have to have like extremely strong calves in order to decrease their chance of, uh, you know, any related injury. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like the calves apparently have more support. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because for skiing, you know, you have, it's, it's different from snowboarding, because snowboarding, both your feet are both attached to the board. But for skiing, you know, both your legs can kind of do different things. And if you have kind of a bad spill, 
you know, with how long the ski is, like it gets stuck on something, then that 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 can lead to a lot of a lot of injuries. Yeah, but having strong calves is is you know helps with that quite a bit, for sure. All right. Uh, any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. Actually, actually, going off that point with the uh, with the muscles, you know, because the because the muscles do a lot of work in helping to maintain the stability of, of your joints, it's really important to um, you know you know first of all you know make sure your muscles are are, are you know they're they're adequate for the task that you're doing, but also to um, if when your muscles start to get fatigued, it's important to you know stop whatever activity or, or make sure that you're being aware of that. Okay. So when, because we talked about muscle fatigue, uh, you know, in the in the last in the last unit, right? And so you use a muscle over and over again, it starts to get fatigued. But even just as a, as an elastic material, right? Um, you know, you're aware of kind of uh, you guys are probably aware of you know. Uh, even a piece of aluminum or a piece of steel, you know, you load it, you know, a couple million times, eventually it's going to get fatigued and it's going to be a lot easier to break. And so the same can be said about, you know, your muscles and your ligaments as well. Okay. Okay. And so that's why, you know, they always tell you when you're working out, you're, you're working with heavy weights, um, you know, if you start to feel tired or you're, you're, you're feeling like your muscles can't support the weight, you know, just, just stop because it's, uh, you know, once your muscles start to reach that fatigue state and they can't, you know, um, you know um, contribute as much to the stability of your joints, you're going to, you're just increasing your injury risk, you know, more and more, okay? So with that said, strengthening... Let me just go ahead. I know we talked about it on the previous page, but let me just put it into a. And just like, you know, just like we saw with, uh, with muscles where, you know, the angle of attachment, it determines a lot in terms of, uh, um, of how much torque and how much strength your muscles can, um, can exert, you know, that angle of attachment can, uh, can affect stability as well, right? And so there, there's kind of a, uh, there's kind of a trade-off, right? And so I think what we said before was that, um, you know, um, for ideal muscle strength or for, I, I would say, muscle efficiency, you want the angle of attachment to be as large as possible, right? And so let me go ahead and draw just two limbs like here, okay. right? And so this one might be your, uh, your, your arm, okay? And so you have your humerus and you have your, um, um, your radius or your ulna, okay? And if we draw your bicep muscle here, right? Right, depending on how it's attached, you know, if we have a attachment angle like this, where it makes almost a 90 degree angle with the, uh, with the muscle, right? Then all of that muscle force is gonna go towards rotating the limb. Right. And so in this case, where the angle of attachment is, um, you know, per, is uh, basically perpendicular to the limb, this is great for, um, you know, producing torque or for, or for muscle, muscular strength. Okay. Um, but, you know, and, we, and we'll do a lot more analysis of this uh, probably starting next week. Let's say that your angle of attachment is more closer to this. Okay. And so it's more flat. Okay. And so you have less angle of attachment. It might seem like something like this is, is, not, uh, is not ideal, okay? Because only, only the vertical component of this force, what I have right here, right? Only this is actually going towards rotating your limb, right? And so a lot of it's actually just being pushed into the joint. Okay? But, you know, that muscular component that's actually pushing the, pushing the limb into the joint, you know, it might seem like that's not, that's kind of wasted effort, 
And so even though this component does not contribute to the torque, what this is doing in, instead is that this is pushing the, 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 um, the limb back into the joint, right? And so this is providing a stabilizing, you can think of it as providing a stabilizing motion um, in, of, the, of the elbow joint. Okay. Right, and so depending on you know what angle that your your muscle is attaching from, you know it can either contribute a lot more to torque or it can contribute a lot to stability as well. Okay, and so there's kind of a that trade off in between the the two. All right, any questions on uh, any questions on this? It's really hard because it's. Uh, I think I think you would you would need to kind of move, put cut it open, yeah. Because it's because you what you're seeing from the outside is is just kind of the exterior. But how exactly you know this muscle right here, like we can see that it's you know it's it's right there. But whether it attaches kind of like this or or like this, it's really hard to just say because it's uh, it depends on kind of what the tendons look like on it. So you would have to kind of look inside. Because I was wondering like if that affected the outside appearance of how you could tell. Mm. It's like that's a big thing in bodybuilding. Like yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So like for the bicep muscles, you always want the long insertion, like with the high peak. But some people have really, really short bicep insertion mm -hmm. when they flex it. So I was wondering if you could tell from that. Mm -hmm. Like, would that give you a hint? Like, if somebody had a really short, stout bicep, that was a ton on the big one. Mm -hmm. Could you tell from that how it was attaching to their bone, or would it still just be an extra? I think I think there, there there's a lot of that would, that would be correlated. Um, so if you're talking about you know kind of big differences in size, and generally as the muscle gets bigger in size, then that kind of pushes the angle attachment a little bit upwards. A little bit. But even then, you know there might be some variability because it, it really depends on how the tendon attaches to to the bone. But as the muscle kind of gets it grows away from the limb, it naturally is going to pull kind of the attachment angle up. Like that. Okay. So it's all basically just down to tendon. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and so that's uh, that's joint stability, and so let's let's talk about the the opposite of, of stability, which is flexibility. All right. And so joint flexibility, what this refers to is that this describes the range of motion that's allowed at each of the uh, um, at the joints. And so the, the reason I call flexibility the opposite of stability is that they're often they're often inversely correlated, although the, the relationship's not always you know like that. So generally, the more flexible your joint is, the less stable it's it's going to be. Okay. All right. And so there there's two kinds of uh, there's two types of flexibility that we often talk about. And so the first one is called a static flexibility. Okay. And so this is the range of motion that's possible when the body segment is moved by an outside force. Okay. And so when something other than your muscles are moving your, um, um, your, your body, and then the amount of range of motion that you can get, that's called static flexibility.
Okay. And so a lot of times the, the way that static flexibility is, is, uh, is determined or measured is that your doctor or maybe your exercise partner will, will move your, your, body, um, your body part for you. Okay? And so without you tensing your muscles at all, you know, the range of motion that, that you get, that's static flexibility. Okay? And so the other type of flexibility is dynamic. And so dynamic flexibility, this is the range of motion possible uh, when your muscles are, are moving your body segments. Professor, is this like flexibility versus mobility? So like, does mobility refer to the same as just dynamic flexibility? Hmm. I, I'd have to I'd have to check, double check and see how they define that um, um, specifically. Um, it see it it does seem to correlate at least at least the way that I think of mobility. But I, I'd have to double check just to make sure that it's the same thing. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because dynamic flexibility is how much flexibility you get on your on your run versus you know how much you flexibility you have by someone moving your joints for you. And so that's that's how I understand mobility, but then I'd, I'd have to double check and, and see just to make sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And the interesting thing about these, these aspects that you would think that they're, uh, um, you know, that they're heavily correlated, um, but these, they can be pretty independent from each other. Cause you know, like we saw with the attachment angle with the muscles, right? When your muscles tense, Right? And so when your muscles uh, apply tension, that affects, you know, how your bones interact at the joints. And so, you know, how much flexibility that you can get by just using your own muscles is different than when your muscles are relaxing and then someone else is performing the motion for you. Okay? And so these two assessments are, they can be independent from each other. Okay. Okay. And uh, and you know one thing that I, I didn't talk a lot about um, instability, but you know flexibility and stability these are these are joint specific, right? And so you can't uh, you can't really say that you know one person overall has very stable joints or one person overall has very flexible joints, right? And so of course things are going to vary between person to person. Um, but it's very possible for someone to have very stable, you know, maybe a very stable shoulder joint, but maybe their knee joint is not that stable, right? And, and vice versa for flexibility. Okay, and so what we uh, the way I say that is that you know these these quantities here are joint specific, okay? and so you have to measure each one individually. And so you know just because you measure the stability of someone's hip joint, it doesn't say anything about their shoulder. And so you have to make sure that you uh, you measure those independently. Okay. All right. Any uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right, and so uh, and so, how is um, flexibility measured? Right? And so, for stability, you know, we 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 talked about that um, contact area is one way that we can measure it. For flexibility, the way that they measure it is simply just by the the degrees that your uh, that your joint can can rotate.
Okay. All right. So and so basically, the way that um, this is measured is that you know when your body is in the resting position, this is kind of at zero degrees. So this is this is kind of the the origin. And so how far you can move your, your body segment away from the resting position, you know, they're going to measure that angle with a, uh, uh, with something called a uh, goniometer, right? Uh, or goniometer, um, then that's going to um, determine your flexibility. And so as an example, you know, when, they, uh, um, when they're um, measuring the, um, the flexibility of your, um, of your hip, okay? And so it might look something like this. Okay? And so they're gonna have you lay down on a, uh, um, on a table, okay? And they're gonna ask you to raise your leg into the air as much as you can, right? So either someone, either you're gonna do it yourself or someone's going to do it for you. because this is flexibility at the hip. And so once you do that, they're gonna take, you know, you're gonna take one of your legs here as kind of the horizontal axis and the other leg here as the vertical one. Okay? And they're gonna measure this angle between them. And so specifically, this is a flexibility for hip flexion. Right? So you're, you're basically flexing your hip. But you can also measure flexibility in the other direction as well. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right. And so now let's talk about some factors that that can influence uh, flexibility. And so just like stability, and so the, uh, the shapes of the bones, um, they're, uh, they're a big determinant of flexibility. Also, uh, another factor that uh, that affects flexibility is uh, just any of the muscle or, or or fatty tissue that's around the the joint as well. Okay. 
right? I saw I saw a really funny video once of uh, of this uh, very, really kind of well built bodybuilder, and then someone took a sticker and they put it in the middle of their back, and then he couldn't reach it just because the the muscles are literally too big for him to flex. And so, um, you know, the size of the size of your uh, um, of your um, of your other tissues can can determine that. Okay. All right. So, so there's another question. Sure. It's like, so do you have see it like in weightlifters a lot of the time too, where it's like they have big upper bodies. But like their shoulder mobility is still like really good. So mm -hmm. does a bigger muscle automatically make you less flexible? Let's say you have a bigger shoulder than somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. Will that automatically make you less flexible than them? Or can you do like stretching and stuff like that that brings you back into the same range of motion that someone with a smaller muscle has? Yeah, so I, I think there, there's definitely room for, you know, stretching your muscles is to add flexibility to your to your joints, but there's a limit because eventually, you know, I think for, for the bodybuilder, what's literally happening is that his, his, his muscle is so big that it's contacting his other muscle. And no matter how flexible it is, you know, that's you're running and you're running two solid objects into each other. And so you can't, no matter how flexible your, your, your opposing muscle might be. If you have two things that are running into each other, then that's going to limit your flexibility. And so, you know, there's, um, you can you can help you can um, you can um, do a lot with stretching, but only up to a certain point because like once once things start contacting each other, then it's uh, then it's that's it. Yeah. I'll give you another example from my personal life where um, uh, where it's 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 a, it's definitely a little bit harder for me to put socks on in the morning because I have to kind of bend down and, and kind of pull up my socks compared to earlier in my life where I, I didn't have as much of a as much of a belly. <laughs> And it's because literally, you know, the, the, the fat tissue in, in my stomach is preventing me from kind of bending over to put in my socks. And so it doesn't matter how flexible my back is, it's because my, if there's, you know, tissue that's kind of running into each other, then geometrically you can't, you know, go beyond that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you like, by stretching, can you increase the elastic properties of your muscles or can you take advantage of them better? Like, for example, let's say like you got a tighter hamstring versus more flexible hamstring mm -hmm. like when you like let's say like if you're deadlifting or, or doing something that involves the hamstring a lot are you better able to take advantage of the elastic properties of your joints in that case if you're more flexible so if you yeah yeah so if you if you stretch then it's uh, it always it obviously loosens them up yeah. um in terms of how that actually how that actually can be tabulated in terms of like material properties or elastic properties mm -hmm. that i'm not 100 percent aware of but um, but I would imagine that, you know, the, actually the tighter your muscles are, the more strength that it would, it, it can actually pull back on. It's just that it's, it just makes it more prone to injury. That's, that's kind of how I was always understood it. Um, but in terms of elastic properties, I don't know how much that it would help. Or, or I haven't, I haven't seen any studies that, uh, um, had, that really measured that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, um, you know, let's, let's talk about the kind of the opposing or how joint flexibility and, and stability kind of oppose each other, right? And so um, joint flexibility, you know, the, um, is actually strongly related to risk of injury as well. And it, and it actually goes both ways. And so, you know, if your flexibility is too low, okay. what this usually means is that the muscles and the ligaments and the tendons are, are, are pretty tight. And so, um, you know, if they're, um, if they're not, you know, as stretchy or they can't, you know, um, or they're not as flexible, then you're going to increase your risk of you know these these tissues hurting themselves.
right? And so the concern, basically, you know, when you're when you have low flexibility at a joint, you know, the main injury concern is going to be actually in your soft tissue, right? And so, you know, if if you have low below average flexibility, then um, you know, then you start to worry, you know, are your muscles too tight? Or are they going to tear? You know, if you if you try to um, you know stretch it too much, are your ligaments going to are they too tight? Or are they too stiff? And so kind of the analogy that I, I like to give for this is that if your flexibility is too low, then it's almost like you have a very brittle um, material. Okay. Right. And so that brittle material, you know, maybe, maybe strong, maybe not. But as soon as you strain it to a certain degree, or as soon as you stretch it to a certain degree, you know, it's, it's just going to, it's just going to break. Okay. And so that's the concern when your flexibility is too low. Okay? On the other side, if your flexibility is too high, then, um, you know, what you're going to, what's going to happen is that, you're, is that your joints are going to have very low stability. And so dislocation is starting to become a big concern. Okay. And so if you're uh, basically, if, if you're, you know, your flexibility is too high, that means your, your muscles and your ligaments are not really doing too much to keep your bones uh, into the joint. And so, you know, it, it basically increases the risk of that bone popping out, and, you know, causing injuries in, in that regard too. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question about this joint flexibility being too high. Is that like what? Like what's up with those people who are like double jointed? You know, like mm. people who can like dislocate their thumb or like bend their elbow like all the way past. Is that an example of just having like extremely high joint flexibility, or is it something else? I think it. I think it's something else. Um, actually, that's a that's a really good question because I I uh, I'm wondering about that too. For for double jointed, what I the way I I kind of think of it is that there's 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 just kind of two positions where the joint can be stable, and so you can kind of pop the joint out of one position. Or pop the bone out of one position and into another one, and that's also a stable a stable joint. That's that's how I understood double jointedness, but I, I'd have to kind of double check. It's it's been a while since I've I've looked I've looked into that. Um, in terms of like you know people with extreme range of motions, um, I think it's just that's just kind of a an, an anatomical kind of anomaly for those people where like just the shapes of their bones and the shapes of their ligaments kind of allow them to do like really crazy stuff without really hurting themselves or popping the bone popping the bone out. So, yeah, those are cases where, you know, just anatomically and genetically, they just have, you know, great shapes for, for, those, for those kinds of things. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so, you know, and so you're, the amount of flexibility that you want is, of course, somewhere in between the two, these two, because you don't, you don't want to be too flexible or not flexible enough, because, you know, in both cases, you're going to be, um, you know, um, you're going to be, you might injure yourself, okay? Uh, and so the right amount of flexibility, of course, depends on you, depends on the, on the task that you're, that you're undergoing, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the amount of flexibility that I would need as, as, a, as a professor is something very different than, you know, something that an athlete would, would need, right? Even someone of the same age, the same age as myself, right? And so a lot of this really depends on the types of activities. But, uh, but what you can do is that, you know, based on these activities that you're doing, is that you can make a prediction. And so you can measure and predict the magnitude of the forces that would that's going to be impacting your joints, um, and then from that you can determine you know how much flexibility you need. And so what we're going to do in the next in the next big unit after the midterm is we're going to start to analyze you know muscles and bones at these joints and to actually compute you know how much forces that your muscles are inputting and how much pressure and how much force is actually at your joints as well. Okay, and so we can, we can use analysis like that to help us determine 
you know, what the right amount of flexibility is and how much stability, how much contact area that you can, that you can have. Okay, uh, any questions on, on this? How much time do we have? We have five more minutes. Okay, so let me start the, the next point and then we'll finish it up after the midterm. Okay. And so let's talk about some, some, common, um, some common injuries that you can have at the joints. All right. And so the, probably the first most common uh, in, or one of the most common injuries that, that you'll see at the joints are springs. It sounds similar, but it's different than strains. Right? So remember last time when we talked about muscles, we talked about strains. And so strains are, are, uh, are injuries to the muscles themselves. Sprains are um, often injuries to, uh, mostly to the ligaments, but they, they can also be injuries to your, uh, to your tendons as well, okay? And so the way these are usually caused, is these are caused by um, any kind of abnormal displacement or abnormal twisting or abnormal kind of motion at, at the joint, okay? Oftentimes these motions are pretty sudden. Okay. And what this is going to do is that it's going to cause either a, uh, a, a, an abnormally high amount of stretching, or in some extreme cases, some tearings of the ligaments um, and tendons or other connective tissue at the joint. Okay. All right, and so one, one type of sprain that's very common is an, is an ankle sprain, okay? And I'm not just saying that because I, I sprain my ankles a lot, but it actually is very common. Um, and in particular, you know, the most common side of, or the most common location for an ankle sprain is on the lateral side, okay? And so that's on the, on the outside side of your, of your ankle. Okay. Because typically when people roll their ankles, they roll it kind of inward. And so that places a lot of stress on the, on the outer ligaments of the of your ankle. Okay. And the reason, and the reason, you know, people tend to roll their ankles inward is that compared to the medial side or compared to the inner side of your ankle, the lateral side has a relative lack of ligament support. And so just, it's just naturally a lot easier to roll your ankle inward versus, versus outward. Right? And rolling your ankle outward is kind of an awkward kind of motion too, because you kind of have to like bow your, your knees in as well. Okay. All right. And sprains, are, they, they can typically be measured on a, uh, on a scale. And so there's a first degree, second degree, or third degree, depending on the severity of, of the injury. Right? So depending on whether you just simply stretch the ligament or you, um, or you stretch it a lot, or you, if it's a complete tear, 
you know, you can give it a, a varying levels of severity, okay? And sprains are, you know, one of those things that are, they can be very painful. Um, and so you know, they're, uh, they're not fun to have. All right, any final questions before we wrap up for today? Okay, All right. So remember Wednesday is the midterm. And so everyone has to show up on, on Wednesday. And so I'm not even gonna open the Zoom call on Wednesday. So please make sure you guys are here to take the exam. Okay? And I'll send an email tomorrow out to remind you as well, right? Um, and so if you have any last questions on the midterm, I do have ops hours the next two days actually before the midterm. And so you can come ask there um, or you can shoot me an email and I'd be happy to answer your question as well, okay? So best of luck studying to everyone. Uh, make sure you check out the review video. And so remember I posted a video on Friday to help you review. And so make sure you check that out and use the study guide as well, right? And so thanks everyone. I'll see you on Wednesday. I have a quick question. So I have a one done by. Yeah. Number one, I was just going to get a few after final element analysis. Sure. That's cool. But yeah, yeah. I just didn't know how to word my answer. Oh, here's your. Here's your. Is the grade for the paper on there too, or is it? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, the paper I graded. I read all of those on campus, and so I, I graded those. Oh, there's no grade on here. Um, you got. I mean, the one I graded. So usually I only grade one question for correctness, and so okay. for this one it was the. It was the report. And so for this oh, one, I just checked to make sure that. You know. oh, okay. Um. So my grades on online then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I basically I don't know I didn't know how to word my answer and like make it sound all, make it sound like you know scientifically mm -hmm. correct or whatever. I just know that like by getting multiple joints involved in a movement like that, you know, because like he's taking advantage of. He's taking advantage of the force generated with his hip by stepping off the ground, mm -hmm. and he's also taking he's also taking advantage of the range of motion of his shoulder and his elbow, and then he's also taking advantage of the fact that he can cause downward velocity by because you know the pitcher's mound is like slanted. Yes. So yeah. by taking a big step like down the pitcher's mound, he's uh -huh. also taking advantage. He can also generate more velocity at his in his torso. I think mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So should I just put something like that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. The, the main, I mean, all of that is correct. But the, the main thing I was looking for in that one was just, you know, the stretching motion, you're taking advantage of the elastic um, properties of the muscle. Okay. Um, but like kinematically speaking, and, and in terms of, you know, um, of just how you can generate the most momentum, everything you said is right. But okay. the only thing I was looking for is that, you know, before you make a big motion, if you stretch mm -hmm. first and then you do it, then, okay. then that's what generates, that's, that's what helps with the whole thing. Okay, so by pulling his arm back, basically, he's just taking advantage of the elastic, yes. the elasticity of his pecs and his shoulders yes. to like help bring the ball forward. Exactly. Okay. That's the main thing I was looking for, but but yeah, the more detailed you can be, that's that's obviously okay. critical. I'll just put that. I'll I'll go to FDA and just put that down right now. Okay. Down. Oh, and then also, I just thought of like this video because he <laughs> went like suit. I'm talking.